It's a spooky time of the year, when conversations turn to all manner of spooky and ghoulish things, like vampires. What are vampires, anyway? Well, the answer takes us well beyond Hollywood, to death, decay, 19th century race politics. Vampires are revenants, spirits that reanimate their bodies to terrorize the living. The vampires we're familiar with hail from Europe, but cross-culturally, revenants take many forms. What of these nocturnal monsters? Can anthropology pull back the vampire's cape to help us evaluate the risk of vampires being more than fiction? For centuries, vampire epidemics have been associated with times of increased instability. The Black Plague is perhaps the best example of this, but episodes of widespread livestock die-offs and social unrest also seem to coincide with the prevalence of vampirism. In fact, Vampires have been a common explanation for this instability, triggering efforts to vanquish these menaces identified in both living and dead forms. So how do you identify a vampire? Forensic anthropology can really help us understand what happens to bodies after death. During the 16th, 17th centuries, a number of plagues ravaged Europe, and that meant that there were a lot of dead bodies that had to be buried, so graves had to be reopened sooner than they normally would. So living people started to see what happened to bodies after death, and this might lead to some of the imagery that we see associated with vampires. First off, the really, really long nails and really, really, really long teeth, big teeth. This is not nails and teeth continuing to grow after death, but rather the tissues around the teeth and the nails, the gums and the cuticles, get dehydrated and start to retract, which makes the teeth and the nails appear longer. What about the dripping mouth? This is probably the products of decomposition being expelled from the body. During decomposition, as the organs decompose, this builds up in the body and it has to be released somehow, usually through the orifice such as the eyes and the mouth. There's also evidence of vampires in their living form. Medical anthropologists point to two diseases, rabies and porphyria, that might be associated with vampirism. These diseases are episodic in nature and their cluster geography might be associated with increases in vampire activity. With rabies, we can explain the dripping mouth of vampires as part of the disease process. Rabid individuals often have a hard time swallowing and they gnash their teeth, which can lead to a buildup of bloody saliva around the mouth. Rabid individuals also often have facial spasms where they curl back their lips, which might lead to the idea of having larger teeth. Individuals with porphyria, which is a blood disorder, often have receding gums, leading to the appearance of really, really long teeth. Those same teeth may also be stained red from a buildup of toxins in the body, suggesting that maybe there was some blood drinking going on. Porphyria sufferers can also be anemic, linking up with the paleness of vampires, and they have often have a skin sensitivity, meaning that they really, really, really try to avoid direct sunlight, much like our vampires. These explanations certainly have merit, but the material culture of medieval Europe is unsettling. At this time, it's very clear that vampires were real. Vampire barrels found across the northern part of the continent really follow a theme of containment. This grave in Ireland is unusual with its heavy chains. Were these added after the interment? Or was there a suspicion that the deceased was a vampire beforehand? More common are measures to keep the actual body restrained, like a sickle across the throat, or this heavy plowshare weighing down this person's chest. Even the classic Hollywood stake is represented in the archaeological record. We also see bodies decapitated and dismembered. The ultimate solution to the problem of reanimating the body is to destroy it. I don't mean to alarm you, but cross-cultural studies of revenants highlight some patterns, in particular an increase in visitations in times of disruption. Given our current reality, a pandemic, a climate crisis, geopolitical events, it seems that the time is ripe for an increased risk of vampirism. This suggests that we should be prepared for this public health threat. Now, it's going to be hard to get on a bus carrying a stake, but I'm happy to report that recent research is confirming the efficacy of garlic as an effective vampire deterrent. 
Bioactive compounds in garlic are linked to hypotensive effects. According to medical researchers in Australia, this reduction in blood pressure would increase vampire feeding time, increasing the risk of discovery and being staked. Over time, this would offer a selective advantage, favoring vampires feeding on non-garlicky victims. Volatiles from garlic, formulated after digestion, are released from the skin with the highest emissions from the neck, signaling very high rates of garlic consumption. This research supports daily garlic consumption as practical public health intervention. I hope this gives you added confidence to fully enjoy this Halloween season. Boo!